Wow, thank you guys so much. Um, we were just joined by 16-year-old Dakota and 11-year-old Joey Myron from Gull Bay, Ontario. So maybe we could give those guys another round of applause. Hello, uh, my name is Kendall Anderson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Samara Centre for Democracy. The Samara Centre for Democracy's driving concern is how do we make decisions together? This is what the work of democracy is all about. However, for democracy in Canada to be truly inclusive and responsive, the question of reconciliation is fundamental. Therefore, tonight, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples, and that Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. And because Samara is concerned with political leadership, we particularly ask our political leaders to meet the responsibilities to Indigenous communities. We ask them to please work across party lines to ensure the needs and aspirations of, political, of Indigenous people are represented in political life. I'd like to take some time to thank our partners and sponsors for this evening. The Foundation, Your Canada, Your Constitution, and Carl Turkstra were instrumental in making this event happening, happen by offering the seed funding. Bennett Jones and BMO have been multi-year supporters of Re Samara's research into democracy in Canada. Thank you as well to the Ivy Family, the Donner Canadian Foundation, and Penguin Random House Canada. Lastly, thank you to the CBC Ideas team who agreed to have their wonderful new host, Nala Ayad, be our questioner tonight. It's our privilege to have them taping tonight's event for broadcast. Having been a huge fan of Ideas for many years, I'm very excited to see where Nala takes it next. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Samara Centre for Democracy in case you haven't heard of us before. We're a national nonpartisan charity. We use research to push for positive reforms to our political system. We want to have reforms that make it more inclusive, responsive, and accessible. So when the staff at the Samara Centre sat down recently to write our strategic plan, we wanted to first outline our values. We wanted to reflect our view that the only way to make effective social change is by acting together. So we said to ourselves, number one, public is better than private. Together is better than alone. And then you'll have to bear with me on this part because it, it gets a little complicated, but representative democracy is better than benevolent dictatorship, oligarchy, or technocratic rule. So when we wrote this up, we kind of laughed. You know, Surely we don't need to say this, we thought. But as we'll hear tonight, defending the public square is not always top of mind for plutocrats and billionaires. So when I was handed Anand's incisive book, Winners Take All, by my board chair, Michael McMillan, he said, this guy has, ex has really outlined the existential threat to representative democracy. So borrowing some of Anand's language, um, I want to say that at the Samara Centre, we believe that the only way to achieve social progress is for citizens to get in the habit of solving problems together in the public sphere, through the tools of government, and in the trenches of civil society. But so what will that mean? Well, democracy is going to be messy, might be a bit slow, but democracy should be based on what citizens need and not about what markets want. And if we don't get it right, if, if we don't put the public good back in the public hands, we will continue to undermine democracy. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers. Anand Girdardas is the New York Times best-selling author of Winners Take All, which will be for sale out front in a bit. Um, he's the editor-at-large for Time, and indeed he has this week's front cover, um, where, which is devoted to the ideas he's going to discuss with you tonight. So pick up a copy of this week's Time. Nala Ayed is the host for CBC Ideas, the CBC radio program devoted to a deep dive into the contemporary thought and intellectual history. She's the author of A Thousand Farewells, A Reporter's Journey from Refugee Camps to the Arab Spring, and the winner of a number of journalism awards. I'd like to welcome to the stage Anand Girdardas and Nala Ayad. So Hello, Toronto. Thank you very much for the introduction, Kendall, and thank you for being here, and thank all of you for yes. being here tonight. 
Um, Can I just say, yeah. there's something behind your head that is concerning to me. Um, I'm realizing that if that was the image used in the invitation um, it, it that was. lured you all here, some of you might be thinking you were here to have a conversation with Justin Trudeau. Um, oh. That is actually me. And I just, want to, I just want to be really, really clear about that. That's not me at a costume party, <laughs> Justin Trudeau. It's just, yeah. yeah. I hope you're here for me, because, yeah. I think everybody's here in the it's right It's been place. confusing yeah, recently. We? Yeah, very confusing times. The, the picture, that may be confusing, but the title is, um, is where I'd like to start. And I, I don't think we'll have quibbles about the title. And the title, of course, is In Defense of Democracy. And of course, there are people who would argue that in this world, we've never had more democracy There's been, you know, th th than at this point in history. So what is it about democracy that you believe most urgently needs defense? I love the language that we heard a moment ago, which is the language of doing things together versus the language of doing things alone. And what I have witnessed and what originated the book was an observation about a phenomenon in the United States that I think is happening to a certain degree in other places, but my analysis is focused on the United States uh, because as a man, it's a good practice to try to underclaim instead of overclaim. Um, and what I observed was this phenomenon where the richest and most powerful people in the United States, and this is true globally, are bending over backwards everywhere you look to change the world. Just that phrase, change the world. I mean, you're often, you're more likely to hear that from a billionaire today than from whichever hippies are still left. Um, it's become the billionaire thing to say. So Elon Musk is changing the world, Mark Zuckerberg's changing the world, Goldman Sachs is changing the world, McKinsey is changing the world. And you see this reflected tangibly in more philanthropy right now than has ever been given away. You see it reflected in all these new tools of empowering uh, the least among us, impact investing, which is, I think, just putting impact before whatever Wall Street normally does. And that's apparently now going to fight poverty. Um, social enterprise, some ice cream company that's also going to help people in Rwanda. People in Rwanda are tired of being helped by ice cream companies, but that's the, that's the vision. Um, tote bags that give back, red iPhone case, everything Bono is involved with, um, and various other things that are the richest and most powerful people, the people with the most privilege, the people in a lot of these elite spaces saying, we know we live in an age of inequality. We know we live in an age of plutocracy. We know this is a second gilded age, and we are on the case. We got it. So that's the first thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening is the second gilded age itself which is getting more gilded, not less. And which is in the United States, you're starting to see you know, the 1%, top 1% of the US now commandeers 49% of new income. Now we got about 400 people in this room, let's say, right? Imagine if dinner, I mean, that would be nice if dinner were to come into this room, but imagine if dinner were carted into this room, right? Mm -hmm. And four people in this room got half the food. The night would end in violence. From, Serious, actually. But somehow you scale it up to the level of the society, millions and millions of people, and you make it money instead of food, and people are like, yeah, I guess that's okay. So why is that? Why is well, that Well, I'm about to say, but, but, but I, I think the question I started to have is, if all these people on the top are doing all this nice stuff, but year by year, they are increasing their concentration of wealth and power, their monopolies are getting more monopolistic, their tech companies are becoming more abusive of privacy and democracy, not less. Uh, if their influence over politics is increasing, not decreasing, then what is all this do-gooding doing? And I think the conventional wisdom out there is that it's, it's getting there, it's all checks in the mail, it's, if only we had several Mark Zuckerbergs instead of one, obviously the scariest thought imaginable. Um, 
maybe we'd be able to solve these problems. There's a lot of if onlys, right? If only we had an effective altruism mo movement so that when you give money away, you could be guided to give it more rationally. If you give it to this NGO, it'll have more impact than if you give it to that one. If only Chinese billionaires could be persuaded to donate philanthropically at the same percentage that American billionaires do. If only, if only, if only. And what uh, all that if only has in common is, if only we could take this system exactly as it is and juice it a little more and help share that juice to the people the system is designed to forsake. And I became curious about an equal and opposite possibility, which is maybe all this extraordinary elite helping in our time is how we maintain a system, an architecture of extraordinary elite hoarding. Maybe the giving while doing some good for some people, while helping some people, while saving lives, I'm not denying any of that. Those malaria nets do go over real beds. Maybe that stuff helps uphold, abets social arrangements, justifies those social arrangements uh, in ways that actually uphold a system that frankly grinds more people down, locks more people out, shortens more lives than any of that do-gooding, all of that do-gooding put together. And although I understand that I sound like an opinionated guy, I, this was a reporting question I had several years ago and I took it on as a reporter and I went into this world and I spent time with foundation presidents, with the greatest best friend of plutocrats on earth, Bill Clinton, um, and various other people who are working in this space of the rich and powerful trying to be warriors for justice. And my conclusion at the end of that journey was when the rich and powerful not only get involved in social change, but obviously naturally get into the front row of social change. They change change. They change what kinds of change are acceptable. They change the discourse we have about change. And they essentially, to Michael's earlier comments, are not interested in the kind of change he talked about, which is democratic, which is stuffed together. I mean, he used soft, cuddly language for it. Everything Michael said is also really expensive for rich people. Right? Mm -hmm. So doing things together is, is great, but it's like super expensive for rich people. Let's be real about it, right? So it's solving the problem of women's empowerment in the way Michael suggested is just really expensive. But Telling that, women to lean in is free. But if there were no vacuum, would those, would those figures actually have stepped in? This is a very important question. So often what happens is people will say, people in that world, a Goldman Sachs person or a hedge fund person or a philanthropist will say, Anand, we are totally with you in theory, but there's this vacuum. There's this vacuum. You know, Anand, the government, I'm totally with you about the public solving things together. I'm with Michael too on that. But here's the problem, Anand, there's a vacuum. The government's just not up to the task, Anand. It's not up to the task. Now this is very interesting because the government not being up to the task, first of all, I don't think is always true. Second of all, to the extent that it is true, is the result of what the plutocrats have done. So it's like ordering room service and then being surprised that food is in your room. They have fought for 30 to 40 years for an America in which we don't solve things together, and we solve as many things as possible alone through the market. They fought for that outcome. They ordered that outcome like it was on the menu. They did that through money and politics. They did it through legalized bribery, effectively. They did it through lobbying. They did it through a massive cultural project that we have all absorbed around the world. Government is kind of bad or slothful or evil or leachy or ineffective. The private sector is amazing. People who make Instagram are heroes, right? Like we have, we now live, we live, we don't realize it, right? We live in this water that they put us in that has created a value system in which making a photo app makes you worthy of being on a magazine cover and someone who's made the country better, but someone you know, in this country who is working on the hardest of figuring out how to keep old people 
healthy and safe and alive in old age or trying to figure out how to deal with the reconciliation issue we heard about. That person, there's just no way. Whoever's the leading person on reconciliation in Canada, I guarantee you has never been on the same magazines. But are you absolving the liberal internet or the liberal democratic political system of culpability in what you're pointing out? What I'm saying is these plutocrats fought for a world in which government did less, could do less, had less money to do stuff. They denigrated government so much that none of the best and brightest people wanted, very few, wanted to go into government. Everybody suddenly wanted to work in boring jobs at J.P. Morgan. And then, having done that, this is the remarkable vacuum jiu-jitsu move they pull. Then they're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. This is so crazy. Government's not effective. Well, I guess I just step into the vacuum. It's like, dude, you created the vacuum. You can't use a bad thing you did to justify your further encroachment on democracy. So we need to actually understand that there's a history to the vacuum and that the people most responsible and the class of people most responsible for destroying the idea that we solve things together cannot be the leaders of the search for solutions from this moment. Can you talk about the, you called it the encroachment on democracy. Can you talk, talk about the dangers of that? So there's several ways in which things that may seem like benign gestures by the most privileged people are complicated for democracy. Um, so first of all, and the kind of most obvious example, is if you make money in ways that are specifically destructive of the social good, which is not everybody who makes money, but is a significant fraction of people who make money. That can be, you make money on an opioids crisis where literally every dollar you make is made from harming the society. It could be that you make money from a technology monopoly that has killed off local media because there's no online advertising market anymore and has compromised democracy and, and, you know, and now you're going to fix public schools because you're Mark Zuckerberg and think that we need your help. That kind of model is reputation laundering. So that kind of giving, what it does is it reduces the social cost of defrauding your society. Now we want the social cost of harming your society to be high, right? That way people won't do it. If we create this way, ex post facto, to reduce your social cost, you're not reducing the cost of the society, you're just reducing your social cost for having done that to the society. What we're doing is we're making it easier for the next person to do that and the next person to do that. And now we have that. Now, people know, you know that you can get away with, as a private equity firm, buying an old age home <coughs> the way the Carlisle Group did, squeezing profits out of it, such that all the old people there start getting bed sores and having overdoses and broken bones. Story in the Washington Post about the Carlisle Group. Real story of what private equity does every day. If there wasn't philanthropy, I think David Rubenstein would be nervous about doing that. But because there is philanthropy, he knows that there's some amount of giving he can do afterwards that'll mean he can still meet the senator who represents the state where that old age home is. That's one. The second thing that this philanthropy abets or this do-gooding more broadly is it is an extension of plutocratic power over areas of public life where we actually want less elite power, not more. Right? Now, I don't think this probably happens here, but in the United States, public education is an area that has become a playground for billionaires. It's literally called public education, <clears throat> provided by the government. But Bill Gates has thoughts about it, his thoughts are everywhere. Mark Zuckerberg has thoughts about it, his thoughts are everywhere. Right? And you have school teachers and principals and superintendents being rich splained by billionaires how to run their classrooms, forced to use tablets from the company where the billionaire made their money, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, one of the most common sources of emails and messages I get is from public school teachers who are like, when did Mark Zuckerberg get the right to dictate my classroom? But he did. Why? Because he made an app to rate women 15 years ago because he was too awkward to meet them in person? That, because of doing that, he gets to decide what public schools are like 15 years later? It literally makes no sense. So 
if you look at a problem like public education, where it's a system where the rich in the United States already have way too much power relative to the poor, having Mark Zuckerberg solve those problems is furthering the power imbalance in the wrong direction. Right? Uh, even if Bill Gates has good ideas, it's who, why does a rich person get to decide what public education is like? Why do we all vote if we're going to create this other way to make public policy that is not subject to public acclaim? So that's the second. The final is a lot of this elite do-gooding alters the terms of discussion about change. And, and this lean-in thing is a really good example. So You talk about change being hijacked, essentially. Yes. Yeah. But a big part of change being hijacked is not just the structures and the backroom deals. It's culture. It's common sense. It's our ideas. So if you think about something like Lean In, which I think is the most hilarious thing, like you basically have this billionaire woman trying to convince women that thousands of years of patriarchy is a posture problem. <laughs> if, women, if women were to recline at a different angle, that's your problem, ladies. You are reclining too much. And if you just stopped reclining, leaned forward as you are now, patriarchy would melt away. Men would behave like princes. Well, not true. That's the kind of idea billionaires often tend to have. Um, and, and the reason that's the idea billionaires tend to have is because that idea would make it free. You could empower women for free with that idea. So that's a pretty good price because that's otherwise a pretty expensive thing to do. The other way to do it, like the real change way to do it, would be, you know, sexual harassment laws that would reduce the power and impunity of men in a bunch of spaces. Uh, universal daycare, which would cost rich people a tremendous amount of money. Universal, uh, you know, family leave and various other policies that have been shown to actually empower women in many countries, including this one. Uh, but that stuff costs rich people money. You have a much higher tax rate than we do in the United States. So they don't want that. So what they do is, they don't just say, well, let's just not empower women then, because they understand how that sounds. That's what they would say 50 years ago, maybe, right? It's a little gauche now. So now what you say is, totally, let's empower women, but let's not do some of that knee-jerk policy stuff. Uh, let's not do the Michael approach of doing it together. It's kind of awkward to do it together. Read, expensive for me. Um, let's lean in. Let's just, women, if, if the ladies just raise their hand more, we don't need to get into all this uh, tax and spend stuff. And it's an amazing con that has worked. How many of you have been to some lean-in related event? Raise your hand. That's actually you're impressive. Your immunity to these things is <laughs> very, Maybe that's why you're here tonight. I mean. But there's the lean-in and then there's the win-win. I mean, it, it, it's a philosophy that we all want to believe. Psychologically, mm -hmm. it, it, it's appealing. Why couldn't there be win-win? And so my question is, is that you've, you've outlined some examples where it doesn't work and it's clear why. What do we imagine when we imagine it working? Well, I think we should talk about win-win for a second because you're exactly right. That Lean-in is a small example of this win-win ideology. At the heart of the, this group that I call market world in the book, which is not just billionaires, it's, it's a set of people and institutions and networks at the very top, the winners of the age of capital, who are committed. This is not about the Koch brothers. This is about a group of people at the top who intellectually are committed to the idea that the age of inequality is a bad problem and we got to improve it. We got to in increase justice, right? These, these are not those billionaires. These are like the woke elites. And my book is about the way in which this group of people that I call market world think about how to make change. And they want to make change. So that's all good so far. And the ideology that informs their efforts, that guides their efforts, because we all act according to some mental model, is the win-win ideology. Doing well by doing good is another word it goes by. And what this essentially means, and it sounds great on the surface, and it takes a second to... It sounds like we've lost the microphone. Try again. Yeah. Billionaires always do this at my events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's that guy. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely that guy in the blue suit. Um, but you've said that win-win is an outright lie. It is an outright lie, but I want to explain why it's seductive before I tell you why it's a lie. 
the, the promise of win-win is, hey guys, we found this amazing new way to empower people on the south side of Chicago by having seven cents from every ice cream cone go to a charter school. You enjoy your ice cream. You don't have to give up the fact that you have a much better public school than they do because you're white. And now they're getting a better school. That sounds nice. Or you go and you say, you know what? Uh, this issue of, uh, of, you know, immigration on the border, it's so painful. But Mark Zuckerberg, make his money at Facebook and he can take some of that money and help some of these kids on the border fight for immigration. Win-win. He gets to be a billionaire, he gets to do whatever he wants, and he's helping people. And that's, by the way, money that, you know, the government's not going to spend because the government's hostile to those immigrants. And what all these different initiatives, with impact investing, your fund can make high returns, you can have four houses, maybe you don't have five, maybe you now have four because you have a slightly less returns than you'd have with a normal fund, and you can fight poverty through this fund. And it's a much better cocktail party story than your normal boring work that you do. And so it's seductive. It's seductive. It's the have your cake and eat it too thing, right? Um, it's sort of the open marriage of economics. <laughs> um, and I think what becomes problematic or fraudulent about it is when you start to poke at the idea a little bit and you start to say, what you're really saying is the only types of social change worth pursuing pay a bribe to the winners to justify themselves. That's actually what you're saying. You're saying that social change that's not a win-win, that's just a win for those below, is bad. You're saying that universal daycare, universal childcare, family leave, anti-sexual harassment approach to empowering women, which will help some people win, but will cost some people money and cost some people impunity, you're, you're marginalizing that kind of solution in favor of something that's an easy, cheap win for everybody. You're saying ending the barbaric practice in the United States of allocating public school funding based on how expensive the homes are in a particular neighborhood, which is how we do it. You're saying you don't have to end that because that's not a win-win. That would be empowering people very much at the cost to rich people. But let's do it the other way where, you know, some hedge fund billionaire can start a charter school, not near their house, but like a little bit far from their house. And as Darren Walker, the head of the Ford Foundation, says in my book, they can tell all their friends they got three minority kids into Yale and feel very happy for themselves. So the problem with win-win is what you are actually saying as a privileged person is, the only system change I want is system change that's going to give me something too. I want to benefit from solving the problems of society including if those problems are me. And what win-win-ism, which is a religion, and if you take away one thing from tonight, it's actually trying to see through the pretensions of win-win-ism, which is everywhere. It sounds so great, whether it's the cupcake company that gives back or the impact investment fund or the social enterprise that does something, something involving Rwanda. But what it is actually saying is that the only change that is acceptable. It, what, what it is actually saying is that we can lift up people down below without moving the people standing on their necks, which is implausible as a matter of physics as well as sociology. You couldn't empower enslaved people in the 19th century in a win-win for plantation owners. You couldn't empower the people who lived in the basement in Downton Abbey in a way that was a win-win for the people who owned the castle and all the surrounding land. You can't empower, you can't empower women as a win-win for men without actually reducing the power and impunity of all men, not just bad men. Real change involves the loss of power. And when we deny that, which is what win-winism is fundamentally about, we defang the idea of change 
of everything that makes it worthwhile. Perhaps, as you say, one of the keys to understanding the challenge to democracy in all of this is to talk, you know, is to think about power and how our understanding of power has changed. You make the intriguing observation um, in your book that Google, Facebook, Uber, um, all of whom are, are powerful forces in our society, all of them act as if they have no power, that they're actually they are the insurgents. I just wonder, um, you know, it's power pretending not to be power. What's the impact of that? It's a very interesting game they play. And this is particularly true of this tech world, as you say. So I have a chapter in the book called Rebel Kings in Worrisome Berets. Um, and I'll start by saying this. In certain countries in the world, you sometimes hear that a civil war has broken out. There's a rebel army going up against the king, going up against the president. And, you know, you got these rebel leaders, classically, in the news footage, you got rebel leaders hanging off the back of a pickup truck, a lot of guns, and they always have those berets. That is the fashion accessory of choice for all insurgent armies. So you got the berets, and sometimes they lose, and sometimes they win. And sometimes when they win, like the guy in the pickup truck, one of those guys in the pickup truck, is like the new king or the new president. Saddam, your Gaddafi, that kind, of, that kind of guy. And it is always a bad sign when after they end up in the palace, they keep the beret. <laughs> if you just think about the leaders who keep the beret, they're always the worst. And the reason they're the worst is because in their mind, they're still rebels. They have not accepted the transition to power. They haven't accepted psychologically in their mind that they have arrived. They haven't accepted the responsibility and the grace that having power requires. In their mind, they're still insurgents up against the man. I say that because Silicon Valley people are people who still think they're in the pickup truck. And now they are the most powerful people on earth. Maybe more powerful than any political leader except a few. And they're still wearing the berets. And here's how they do it. So Mark Zuckerberg will never call Facebook a company, as far as I hear. He you know, always calls it a community. It's a community. It's just a community of people, just like this room, just hanging out. Um, and all of them play this game. Uber and Lyft, in these lawsuits that have happened, will say, we're not a car service company. We don't arrange car rides. We're just a platform that connects random people who want to give rides to random people who want to get rides. Sure, we set the prices and organize it and create rules and sometimes fire drivers off the platform, they don't comply with like a million standards, but we're, we're not involved. We're not a car company, right? Fascinating click. Why? Because if you were to actually say you're a car service company, you might have responsibility for what happens when a driver like stabs a passenger or the other way around. Why has it taken so long for those questions to be answered? Well, just to stick with this a, a second, I think the move is to say, when you are getting so powerful that you might be at risk of being resented, of being regulated, of having people come free with a wealth tax, whatever, if you can play the insurgent, you wear the hoodie, if you can play that game, you feel like you might be able to delay being perceived as power and might be able to de delay your power being checked. And I just wanna say very clearly, when you have a tremendous amount of power, denying that power isn't humble, it's abusive. Right? And they are abusing our societies in so many ways. Facebook alone. I mean, how does this company get away with literally selling out American democracy to a Russian cyber war operation? But that's the question I'm asking. How do they get away because with it? Because of the power of the story. And I think no one believes the story in 2019. But in 2018 and 2017 and 2016, we were still in this, like Mark Zuckerberg is a communitarian, you know, kind of aw shucks, awkward guy who just likes writing code. It took a very long time for us to realize Mark Zuckerberg is one of the most dangerous people on earth, right? Um, it was interesting, like I was, 
I just recently learned, like, pushed out of one of my, this, like, fellowship that I was in a little bit because of the book I wrote. People didn't like it. Felt it was critical of the kind of people they do. And, you know, like, someone who works at Facebook was not kicked out of it. So that's kind of interesting. Like, apparently this, what I do, is dangerous, but selling out American democracy to the Russians is not. So we are very, uh, we have been very forgiving of these, of these robber barons. The word robber baron itself is 100 years old. People used to feel comfortable using that. Presidents used it. You know, I don't think anybody in the top of political life would use that term today, in part because they want to raise money from them. We got to reclaim a certain early 20th century heritage of understanding that the only way to fight for and defend regular people is to stand up and name it and call it out when some people have too much wealth and too much power and use it to abuse the common good. I want to quote a little bit from the the Time Magazine article that was mentioned that, that you published just this week. You say that history is the story of conditions that long seem reasonable until they begin to seem ridiculous. So it is with America's present manic hyper-capitalism. The, the other sort of subtitle to that article is that the party's over. What's the evidence that the party's over? I think we are living in a time that feels very short-term hopeless and to me, medium to long-term, hopeful. And the evidence for me is that, you know, I think this era of neoliberalism that we have been in since the late 1970s, good 40 years, I think it is sputtering out. And the evidence of sputtering out is the fact that everybody from the left to corporate CEOs acknowledges that there's a crisis of capitalism. Now, the left has been saying that for a long time, but the number of people agreeing with them has gone up. I write in the piece that Democratic Socialists of America, their membership has multiplied tenfold since 2016, right? That's the kind of growth that usually capitalists uh, experience. Um, <laughs> but you also have CEOs, Ray Dalio and others, who are completely unenlightened people saying we have a crisis of capitalism and the American dream is lost. When they're saying the same thing, that's interesting. You had Bernie Sanders in the United States winning 22 states, not just as a democratic socialist in America, which is already, you know, but as, a, like, but as basically like Larry David in a suit, <laughs> right? And like the idea that he won 22 states up against the most powerful political family in America was just pretty significant. You know, I think the fact that all these companies from Whole Foods and all, feel this need to get out in front of this rage by doing conscious capitalism, new capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, none of which I think is that significant, but all of which reflects a recognition that there's a need to act. What all of this seems to reflect to me and all the do-gooding that I described at the beginning is a growing awareness that this system of neoliberalism, the system of essentially telling people that the good society, the best society, is best achieved by leaving people to make as much money as possible in whatever ways they can, cutting every social corner possible. Don't pay taxes if you can avoid it. Don't pay wages if you can withhold them. Don't, you know, go, feel free to go to Washington or go to Ottawa, lobby for public policies, bottle service public policy that's good for you and your friends, bad for the common good. Do all of that. And then spend the time of reading glasses and grandchildren, giving a little bit back to some of the people you helped hurt. I think that model is going bankrupt. And I think more and more people recognize that. I travel around and meet a lot of people who recognize that in all parts of this question. I think the question now is what replaces the age of capital. The age of capital may have five years left or 10 years left, but I don't think it has 50 years left. I don't think it has 20 years left. What replaces it, though? And I think, broadly speaking, there's two claimants to the throne. Donald Trump represents one of them. I know you have your, uh, your type here, um, which is sort of tribal nationalism, the politics of blood and soil, demagogy, essentially taking the anger that plutocracy has caused and diverting it onto some mythical Muslim Mexican rapists that caused all these problems the difference between punching out, you say, and punching up. Yes. Can you explain Taking that? Taking the consequences of people having been punched down from on high 
And instead of punching back up at the people who did that, punching further down at an imagined Muslim Mexican rapist who's caused all of America's problems. The other claimant to the throne that could replace the age of capital is the age of reform, which is what I am out here advocating for. And I think it's easy to think about who should the next president or prime minister be. It's easy to think about, you know, what's one thing I can do tomorrow. But I think we actually have to think bigger about, like, what's the next era we want to live in? Right? We're, we've been living in a 40-year era that has delimited the, the possibilities for all of us, that has delimited the language for all of us. The more exciting question is now, like, what do you all want the next 40-year era to be? We can make that. This 40-year era of the age of capital was made Jane Mayer has an amazing book called Dark Money about how, frankly, five rich families on the right in America like, engineered and architected the neoliberal consensus in the age of capital and funded institutes and did various other things to make that a reality. Surely there's way more people who can help shape something that's different, an age of reform in which public purpose becomes the driving engine of, of society, in which people feel more attracted to going into public service than working at Instagram, in which in which we remember that changing the world together intentionally on purpose, as Michael said, is actually the heritage of how we made any changes worth making, right? Um, I said this morning to a smaller room, and it's true in this room. Like, 50 or 100 years ago, most of the people in this room wouldn't be allowed to be in this room for various reasons. How did the people who wouldn't be allowed to get in the room get in the room? Because rich people threw coins at you? No. There were social movements that changed the law and policy. That's the only reason anybody who wouldn't have been here 50 years ago is here. So when do we start forgetting that? When do we start forgetting how we changed the world heretofore? And how do we start making choices, whether you are just a person doing a job, whether you're a small-time giver, a philanthropist, an activist, whatever. What's your thing that you can do to not just put a band-aid on some problems or treat a symptom, but hasten the coming of the age of reform. The question that comes up when you talk about reform, reform or rethinking, I guess, democracy is what we're talking about, is how much does that process lead us to a point where we've lost a connection of the roots to democracy? Like, for example, have we lost entirely the idea of, you know, the common good or a commons? It's a very good question because in many ways this, my book is a book about culture. I do not believe, I mean, I think the perception that people have is that the way something like plutocracy is maintained, a power structure like that, is through hard power in a way. And obviously hard power is involved. Um, but I think culture is maybe the most important way in which something like plutocracy or the age of capital entrenches itself and preserves itself, right? Um, thinking of Michael's use of the word public, I have this passage in the book where I talk about how throughout history in the English language, words related to public were better words than words related to private. So you think about privation, deprivation, like not good words. You think about republic, good word. It's only very recently that everything public became bad and everything private became good. Private jet, private this, private that. And that's a cultural problem. And it's a storytelling problem. And the five families on the right in the United States who prosecuted this revolution understood the power of culture. And this is a very interesting thing. I think we often think about the left as being more associated with like culture and learning and ideas. But one of the shocking things for me about Jane's book is that actually it showed how much the right understood the power of language and culture and values, how much the right understood the importance of universities. You know, thinkers on the right never want for anything. If you generate the ideas that generate the talking points for Fox News, someone will make sure you're at a think tank somewhere, you're taken care of, your books are, right? Charles Murray, those kind of people. The people doing that same work on the left are like struggling freelancers who like end up having to do other jobs and not be writers, right? The left just does not sponsor and help people doing that. So I think what we gotta do 
is tell an equal and opposite story about the common good, recover words like public, and not do this half compromise, you know, well, yeah, government is kind of ineffective, but, you know, maybe we could make it better. That kind of apologetic counterattack to their attack on government, I think we got to do the militant counterattack. What does that look like? It looks like starting to be real about the fact that this notion that all entrepreneurs are brilliant geniuses and everybody in government is a slothful leech is a fraudulent lie. I am on airplanes all the time. I always sit next to businessmen named Bob. <laughs> and Bob is always on the phone loudly until the absolute last moment that he is forced to turn off his phone on the runway. And here's what Bob's talking about, always. I've never heard in my, all my years one Bob having a conversation with him. I was like, that was really intelligent and meaningful. <laughs> uh, yeah, hey, uh, Charlie, uh, just, uh, yeah, if you could just make sure Melissa's copied on that email to Perry and, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure there's no surprise at the meeting and, uh, yeah, if you just loop me in and, um, yeah, like, the Google Doc's good and, yeah, I just want to be kept in the loop on that and... My point here is, I'm not sure when we decide as a society that people who help administer, like, health services in Canada are useless leeches and Bob is tremendously socially useful. I actually, I, like, I don't want, I don't want to come halfway to their position. I want to, like, understand when did our society decide that Mark Zuckerberg was someone who deserved to go on magazine covers instead of, you know, prison? Like, <laughs> when was that decision made? Um, There's a starting point. What would you do? What, there has been a lot of discussion about how to regulate companies like Google and Facebook and how to make them pay for things they've done. Where would you begin with, with regulating big tech? I mean, I think, first of all, the proposals that you've, you've heard to break up the biggest tech companies are absolutely right. I think the decision to allow Facebook to acquire Instagram and WhatsApp should be reversed. These should be three terrible companies instead of one. Um, um, and as that comment reveals, that's not going to be the end of the work. Um, you know, they should all be regulated. I mean, our banks, I mean, not, not to say anything too positive about our banks, but the reality is our banks are heavily regulated, and they'd be even worse than they are if they weren't. And we still have a lot of problems with our banks, and they still cause a crisis every 10 years, but at least it's not every year anymore, or whatever it could be if we weren't, had no protections on them. And these tech companies, which I would argue, I mean, I understand money has a contagion effect, but if you are in charge of, like, the portals into people's brain, if you are, for many young people, the only source of information they get about democracy, the idea that that is completely unregulated, while we, you know, have probably thousands of pages of regulation on car loan regulation, it makes no sense. It just, I just, I don't understand it. Um, you know, I often joke about, like, it's so amazing in retrospect, one of the things I studied for the book is the, the first Gilded Age and how it came to an end, and you really had this period very, very similar to ours 100 years ago, these new fortunes, this industrial age, a lot of business progress, not a lot of social progress for a lot of people. And one of the things that was striking was like how alarmed people got by like a steel monopoly or a coal monopoly or a railroad. Now, I'm not minimizing those monopolies. They were serious monopolies. You don't want one guy to own all the trains, etc. But it sounds so childish, the things they owned, relative to what Mark Zuckerberg owns or the Google people. Like Mark, so, so if you had Mark Zuckerberg's monopoly is like if you started with a steel monopoly but then you took all the steel rods that only one guy owns and you jammed all the steel rods into everybody's brain on earth and you allowed one guy to put into those brains through those steel rods anything he wanted and to take out from it anything he wanted and to control their behavior, then you'd start to understand how much more dangerous these monopolies are than just someone having market power in steel. Mark Zuckerberg, if he wanted, and I'm not saying he wants to, but I don't know that he doesn't, Mark Zuckerberg absolutely has the power to tip federal elections in many societies. Simply, I mean, and they've shown, simply by showing people who are, you know, on the left that your friends all voted, 
you hugely are increase their participation. If you've decided that you wanted to only show that to people on the left and not show anybody on the right that all their friends voted, like you could easily tip a close election. How is that a power that is unregulated? Whereas the people who sell me my car lease are just drowning in, in, in regulation. It makes zero sense. Uh, we have to stop creating this special exemption for the world-changing tech bro and understand they're just a chemical company with you know, cheaper clothes. You say that the part of the solution, not just to this problem, but to a number of others you've outlined, is politics. It's good old democracy. I wonder that despite all the evidence to the contrary, you know, to that, how you restore faith of the average person in voting as a means of effecting change, of movements, of people getting on buses and going to vote to actually make the change they're after. You know, democracy is like your family, right? Next week is Thanksgiving in the United States, a lot of people going, millions of people going home to their families. You don't go home to your family because your family is awesome. <laughs> your family might be awesome. Your family also might not be awesome. In some calendar years it might be awesome, in some calendar years it may not be. You go home if you can, because it's your family. And the difference between democracy and like some company or some foundation or something, like, this is the shared institutions you have. And so, whether it's good or bad, should not affect your decision to be involved in it. This is a very important point. The same way with your family. If your family is dysfunctional, that may be the time to get more involved in it. So, if your government is not working, and again, I want to reject the premise, actually, that government is singularly ineffective because of all my time sitting next to Bob. But to the extent that you feel like government's not up to solving certain problems you see in your society, which is true, the same way the corporate sector is not solving those problems and nonprofits are also not solving that problem and a bunch of people are not solving that problem, but the government is not solving it also, that is precisely the moment to jump in. If you bemoan the quality of public servants, become a public servant. Like, it's very weird to criticize institutions that are a representative form of us. You're really just criticizing yourself, right? Like, if you don't like how it works, that's precisely the moment. That's what a republic is, to jump in and make it work better. And so we need way more people running for office. We need way more people working in the civil service, doing things that are unsung but have huge power over people's lives. This is an amazing book by Michael Lewis. I'm giving you so many books to read. Michael Lewis called The Fifth Risk that actually just explains what a lot of the unsung people in the lower parts of the American bureaucracy do, and it's the same in this country. You know, it's not the famous people, it's not the cabinet people, it's just like, what is someone who oversees a $30 billion fund at the US Department of Agriculture? $30 billion a year to fund like food innovation that the market would never support. Now, no one knows that person's name. $30 billion a year of funding for food innovation in America is a lot of money. That person is having more of an... And I bet no young person in this room would have thought that I could do that job, right? But every bank is coming for you. So we just need to actually have a new age of public purpose in which more people are doing those jobs, more people are running for office, and the way you make government better is by getting involved in government. You don't wait for it to get better to join. Right? You want to warm up a pool, put your body in there. How do you persuade people to jump in? I think, but I, like, I see what you did there. Uh, <laughs> you're good at this, you should be in the CBC. <laughs> um, I think by telling a different story, to go back to the culture point, I would like people to realize the extent to which the stories we have told in our time about how you make change, that you make change from an impact fund, that you make change with a tote bag that gives back, that you make change with give one, get one shoes, etc. That these stories, that, that Goldman Sachs' 10,000 women program is empowering people even though they hurt millions of women in the financial crisis, that these stories were invented by people. Now, they're bullshit, but the inspiring thing about the fact that people got together, invented bullshit stories, and then we all started believing them, is you can do that too. <laughs> you can actually invent true stories. And there is a different new true story to tell 
about what we can do together. There's a true story to tell about real change as against fake change. There is a true story to tell about the role that government plays in all our lives. Any magazine editor in this room can actually come out of tonight thinking, there's some different people I should put on my cover. That's a choice any magazine editor can make tomorrow. You can decide who to feature on your show. And we in the media, we're both in the media, have hugely over-featured boring-ass people who work for businesses and hugely built them up as thought leaders and change agents when they're literally people running the most banal companies and have hugely undertold the stories of people like the person running a $30 billion food innovation fund. We can all make those changes. But I don't believe in individual action for individual solutions. What I'm talking about is individual action towards a collective solution. And it starts with making the idea of public purpose the lodestar of society again. It is not right now. The lodestar of society right now is money. A French journalist was once sitting next to me at a discussion where we were talking about some of these issues, and she said, ah, I see, I think I understand. You're saying in America, business is not just a sector, it's a culture. And it was so profound what she said, such a simple, elegant summary. Business has become our culture. It's become our value system. We have become, to quote, I think, a historian, maybe Sean Molens, a business civilization. That's not the heritage. I don't think it's who we want to be if we think about it. And I think it's possible to build a civilization on different principles. Thank you for that. I know there are some questions in the audience as well for you, so we'll take some of those now. Thank you. Um, uh, maybe just put up your hand. We have some microphones here. There's someone just there in the back with a red shirt or a sweater. And, and sorry. Yep. That's the second person there. Go ahead. You, you, you can go ahead. Oh, please. okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you didn't mention monetary policy at any point tonight. Monetary policy. Uh, we've had super low interest rates for like 10 years straight. Um, could you comment on why you don't mention the fact that super high leverage benefits people with assets and maybe a solution for people who don't have money is to encourage them to buy assets? So I'll give you a stat, I'll give you a before you answer, I'll give you a stat. 50% of Americans own stocks in the stock market, 50% don't. Uh, isn't a solution just to get 100% of Americans to own the stock market? Next question. <laughs> I just, I mean, I look forward to your book on monetary policy, but it's not the book I wrote, and I don't know anything about that. Okay. The, the, the red arm in the back, the first person to put their hand up. Yeah, that, that was me. Uh, my question is about community change and the culture of community change in Canada. So we know for decades that a lot of community change leads to poverty reduction, and that means businesses, civil society, government working together to create those changes. So I'm wondering from your perspective, how do you think business... Billionaires can you, again. Can you hear me now? Uh, how do you think businesses can work... Just, just repeat the last bit of the question, please. Okay. For, ooh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, and differently to create positive changes in collaboration with other stakeholders. So what do businesses fundamentally yeah. need to do differently? So, I mean, a, a different word for the, the thing you're describing is what's called multi-stakeholder theory, which came out of the World Economic Forum, that great change-making agent um, up there in Davos. So, I think there's a couple different ways to, like, to think about what you're talking about. You know, there was this theory, the multi-stakeholder theory, which is that instead of the old, more conflictual relationship of government attends to the common good through shared public institutions, and then business tries to make its money, and then they clash, what if we had a new model where it's not regulation and taxation as the primary mechanism, but they kind of get together? And they do partnerships. That's the big, you know, public-private partnerships, multi-stakeholder. And this, again, it's like the win, it's very win-win oriented, this notion. The problem, I'm not saying there's no areas where this is the right thing. You know, so one of the areas I write about in the book is like childhood obesity and diabetes and 
and in America and like all the soft drink companies that muscle their way into public schools and force these drinks on kids that have no leverage to fight back. And I had an argument with Bill Clinton in the pages of the book about why he thought the best way to solve that problem was in the kind of way you describe. Let's bring government in, let's bring the soft drink companies in, we'll do a collaborative solution. And what they did was they made the cans smaller. So I guess those kids have to drink two cans to get diabetes now. Um, and it was just like not, a, the idea that they had was like not just make it illegal to put life-shortening beverages in public schools. The problem I have with that kind of approach is it puts government and business at the same level, but they're not at the same level. And it gives business, and this is a really important point that people don't realize, it gives people a, business people a veto over forms of change that they don't want to work on. So it's not like they're working on the same stuff they are working on anyway, right? If Bill Clinton has two ideas, one idea is let's not have it legal to have soft drinks in public schools, and my other idea is let's make smaller cans. If you propose a public-private partnership, which means like they're funding some of this initiative, right? They're deciding, like they have a say in whether you're gonna do it or not. Which one do you think they're gonna pick? So they're distorting the outcome by, by being in the team. Um, and so I think we actually, again, I'm not ruling it out for all types of problems. I think there's some problems where maybe that's the right approach because it's not quite a simple regulatory problem. But I think we have to, like, re on many of the biggest shared problems, we have just regained the confidence in the idea of our shared institutions being something, frankly, that is more sacred and more legitimate than what Pepsi wants to do about childhood obesity. All right, there's a question over here. Please, st stand up. Oh, okay. If you'd like. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for your great work. Um, I saw something recently that kind of was interesting to me, and that is that here in Canada, Lockheed Martin has been sponsoring uh, Habitat for Humanity. So the company that basically bombs houses is now building houses. Um, it's but a nice it was, little loop. Yeah, it is, right? Yeah. Um, but the but never in the same places. <laughs> no, exactly. So... That's one of the things that I'm wondering, how do we tackle some of the companies that make the most money are defense contractors, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, but they are intimately tied with creating uh, the social good. Science and innovation is completely tied with weaponry. So how do we tackle that? It's really interesting. I mean, this is so widespread. The, you know, the, the worse the company, the better the do-gooding. You know, Wells Fargo has this, had this program that I saw, you know, teaching users of our bank financial literacy, how to keep your accounts safe. Now, this turns out to be an incredibly important skill if you're a Wells Fargo customer <laughs> because it was revealed that some of their employees were stealing your credit cards. So, nice to have that little program to help people from the problem you are causing. Um, bombing houses and, and building them. One thing I'll say is, it's, it's important to remember, although you framed it as a kind of parallelism, which I often do too, it's very important to remember the scale of the houses being bombed far exceeds the number of houses being built. Not to say that if they were at the same scale, it would still be okay, but we gotta remember, a lot of the harm doing is in the scale of billions of dollars of money being made, and a lot of the do-gooding is on the scale of millions of money dollars being given away, right? The Sackler, family members who, who helped create the opioid crisis in America has killed hundreds of thousands of people. Genocide level numbers of human beings murdered in a, in a you know, preventable, fraudulent sale of drugs over years. And a machinery, according to the Attorney General of the State of New York, Letitia James, in a complaint, a machinery facilitated by the philanthropic gifts that this family made to various arts institutions, which allowed them to be seen as the philanthropist family instead of the, you know, drug death family. Like, we have to understand the way in which the Habitat for Humanities and the art museums and others of the world unwittingly become participants in massive harm doing. And I think we need a new conversation that has not been a fashionable conversation 
about what money do you not take? And are you willing to have your NGO be half as big, but not be part of a legitimizing engine, particularly the universities in the United States, I don't know how bad it is here, have become drive-through reputational laundromats for the worst money and worst people on earth. And I think if you are Harvard, particularly if you are Harvard and you have so much money already, it's okay to not create that additional center. It's okay to not get that Basquiat painting, as much as I love that guy. It's okay, it's okay. But don't become Jeffrey Epstein's child rape erasure machine. Harvard is above that, you would hope, but it's not right now. And a lot of universities are not right now. Okay, there's a question back, way in the back there, okay, please. And just, there's not a lot of time left, so please keep your questions, oh, sorry, right here. Please keep your questions short. Thank you so much. There's no microphone on that. Yeah. Your taxes Can you just are add way. A no, 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 no. Hold on. I, okay. I, I, I hear you. Let me, let me answer this. Your taxes are way higher than America's, and you have a much more decent, dignified society. And you have a much, uh, billionaires again, that guy. Um, <laughs> and you have a much more decent, dignified society as a result. I mean, it's actually the reverse of your example. In theory, everyone here should just be, you know, everybody rich here just should be somewhere else. Actually, you still have a very successful country here with much higher tax rates. You know, we need to start playing poker with these rich people. They're really, they're going to leave? They, they don't want to be in the Canadian market? Okay. They don't want to be in the United States market? I mean, the United States is 25% of the world economy, but they don't want to be there? Okay. These banks think certain wealth tax is too onerous? That's cool. You, you can incorporate wherever you want. Somalia, Morocco, just like, where do you want to base your bank? You, I mean, you're welcome to use the American federal court system that we've all built and paid for. It's a really amazing federal court system. It's so good that even Donald Trump, like, can't, there, we have so many institutions like that, that even the most dangerous president in American history does not make that much work. I mean, you know, he's put some bad people in there, but it's such a durable system that for everyday people running a business, it's this thing that you know, you know, your bank's not going to get stolen by some guy. You don't want to benefit from that? That's, not, that's fine. You don't want the universities that we have? That's cool. Let's actually play poker with these people. You know, let's play poker with them. They all say they're going to go to Singapore. Okay, go to Singapore. All right. <laughs> go to Singapore. There, there we go. Please. So, uh, have you run a business before or started a business? Have I what? Have you started or run a business before? No. Okay, so... I think, I think there's a disconnect, I think there's a couple of disconnects in your logic. And I think the reason for that mm -hmm. is... This is going to be one of those that doesn't have a question. Yeah, no, I, no, no, I really no, caution no, no, against no, no, that uh, because no, we have it, a few it, more it's, questions it's, down there. It's, so it's, it, it's super please. quick. I think the issue is there's a priority. And so how do we as a community, we run for politics, but if we don't elect the right leaders, how do we change? I think the re and I'm the fraud that supports CSR. And I use CSR because the right people don't get elected. What's your, what's your solution for that? Thank you. You use CSR because the right people don't get elected. I mean, you're, the right people don't get elected. The way you're saying that is the passive voice. Then work to increase the odds that the right people do get elected. We, 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 we treat these things as being the weather. They're not the weather. They're the outcome of our choices, which, by the way, is also happening to the weather now. Um, but... <laughs> didn't think that one through. Um, 
But I think the problem is with something like CSR that you end up convincing yourself, depending on who you're doing it for, that you can run some program to mentor 200 girls into tech, but your company may avoid a billion dollars in taxes every year that would allow two million women to get better education in tech. And you don't realize that you may be not only fighting on both sides of a war, but actually doing way more on the wrong side of that war, unbeknownst to yourself, than on the positive side of it. There's a question back there. Very much for being here tonight. Um, uh, you mentioned that we need more driven, more motivated, uh, passionate people uh, to choose government jobs over business jobs. I was just wondering if you yourself have thought about going into government, and if not, why? Um, you gonna run? Um, I have thought about it at different moments in my life. I actually pursued it like when I was right out of college. I like thought about it, tried, applied for things that I did not get. Um, I think for me, I do work on the public sphere as a writer and as a journalist who covers that sphere. And to be clear, I think when I'm saying work in the public sphere, um, I'm not only saying working in government or running for office. I think if you're an economist who helps supply the kinds of policies that people can enact and understand more fulsomely, like you're also working in that sphere. If you're in a you know, think tank that helps increase the odds that public policy is done well, like you're in that sphere. Um, in terms of like specifically being in politics, like I will say I've thought about it a few times. I don't think it's where my talents would lie. I think I'm probably better doing what I'll do, um, but who knows? That sounds like an open door. Last question, <laughs> last question right here, this is it. Um, media obviously has a tremendous influence on how people see and view these things. You're obviously very prominent in the media, and, and it strikes me that there's a, a great deal of, of loss of neutrality in media. It seems you have people on the far right and the far left. How do you think that's impacting the conversation, how does that influence um, uh, how people think about these things? I, I do think we, we obviously are in this time of media polarization that is, it's a big problem. And it, it's not actually just um, polarization, it's parallel reality. You know, so this week has been this historic week in the United States for these impeachment hearings and this really extraordinary array of nonpartisan patriots coming one after another, many of whom wanted to work for this president, worked for him willingly, and have just kind of, you know, stabbed him in various ways through telling the truth. And I was watching and thinking, like, the guy's done. And then you see the parallel reality of a different news channel or different parts of a feed literally just saying like the opposite. A lot of people now are saying, you know, three of the amazing people who testified over the last few days were immigrants. You know, Fiona Hill today has a British accent, um, and Yovanovitch and, and Vindman were both born in the former Soviet, uh, actually one, Yovanovitch in Canada, Vindman in the former Soviet Union. And it's an amazing tribute to America. And this would be the case in, 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 in this country also, that we have these people. And then people on the right are saying, isn't it interesting that all the people coming up against Trump weren't born here? Are they spies? Are they infiltrating? So this problem of parallel reality, I don't have an easy answer for you. I think it is one of the gravest problems facing us. I mean, I don't want to get into the business of saying channels should not be allowed to exist. I'm also not sure how a channel like Fox News is consistent with the future of, of free people making educated choices, um, particularly when it's essentially collaborating with a white nationalist government. I, I don't know. I think one, among the many things that young people are gonna have to invent in the world that we have left them um, is a new media landscape that finds new ways of telling the truth that get people's attention, which is a lot of what this comes from, without doing it the way that people currently do. 
What's the thought that you want this, this audience to walk away with tonight? I know a lot of what we have talked about today um, is it can feel, and maybe it doesn't feel this way to you, but I think some people hear me or read the book and feel this is very depressing, and some people hear me and read the book and think this is so hopeful and inspiring. And it may just also be a function of how you see things or where you are in this question. But I, what I am trying to suggest is profoundly hopeful and is a message of possibility. Because I think we have been sold a phony story about how you make life better. As Michael said, alone, by chance, through the market, and frankly, in ways that have those on high throwing scraps of change at us. And I think it's possible to organize the world a different way. And I think that's what's dawning on a lot of people now. It is, the age of capital is a thing that could actually end because it was man-made. Synthetic things can be replaced. And what we have the opportunity to do is to reclaim the heritage of what we do together as being more admired, more exciting, more energizing than what we do alone. And what we have the opportunity to do is to make democracy, put it back in its place as the central enterprise of the society, the great excitement of our society. And while you don't have individually the power to dethrone a Mark Zuckerberg, what you do have the power to do today, tomorrow, and the next day is to start joining things, click less, join more, actually be part of organizations, like the people in the matching t-shirts here, they're all part of the same thing. Um, be part of the same thing, be on membership lists, be part of movements, part of causes that actually meet IRL in actual places. And I think if we do that, and we actually build the kinds of cross-racial, cross-class coalitions of people, that actually say, we want the future to benefit most people. A radical notion in 2019. We want the technological revolution to make most people's lives better. A radical notion in 2019. We are open to trading with China and other countries, but we want the fruits of that to benefit most people. A radical idea in 2019. If we build movements to that effect, I think we can end this age of capital. I think we can usher in the age of reform. And I think we can resume the idea of democracy as the place we go to change the world. Kremlin Geradaridas, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.